Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. My name is Ethan, and as the title suggests, I am a student of history. I mostly focus on 18th century Enlightenment history, and I also do a little bit of 20th century Eastern European history. So today, we're going to be reacting to The Men with Six Faces, The Life and Times of Talleyrand. Considering I sort of focus on the Enlightenment period, I obviously know a little bit about Talleyrand. You know, I know he was a, a French political figure. Um, he served under Louis, he served under the French Revolution, and under Napoleon. He was a snake of a man <laughs> who was able to successively make his way through each regime, uh, even though usually one regime hated the other. So, I don't know too much about him, but he seems like a very interesting figure, and I'm excited to get started, so let's do it. Working in government in France during the long 19th century was challenging, to say the least. In 50 years, yep, the country you could went say from that. a monarchy, to a republic, to an empire, to a monarchy, then to a different monarchy, and most of the time, working for the old regime was a great way to lose your career, maybe even your head. And yet there was one man who coasted through six regimes, a man, it seems, who never believed in anything. It's not amazing that France even had that many regimes. Not equality, not conquest. He only believed in France. Yeah, and himself. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Magellan TV, a streaming service made by filmmakers home to over 3,000 documentaries from all eras of history and beyond, like Gotta watch through the ad. And space. It's just respectable. I like their stay-at-home travel guide collection. It's a great way to experience a mix of everything the service has to offer and forget about being stuck at home for a year. They're giving you, dear viewers, a special offer of 30 days subscription for the low, low price of $0 at MagellanTV.com slash wow. Jack Rackham, and I'll be back later with some actual history recommendations. Monsieur Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perregard was oh, born Talleyrand. in an aristocratic house about as old as France itself, but it was never really a powerful house, and by the end of the 18th century, it certainly wasn't a rich one. His mm -hmm. best option, if he wanted to change that, was to do what his dad did and join the army and climb up the ladder. But climbing was difficult for young Talleyrand, along with running and jumping. Anything to do with legs, really, because he was hit with a limp from childhood. So he decides to make some cash with his words and joins the clergy. He was a bright young pupil who spoke quite eloquently about the inalienable... Yes, Talleyrand, perhaps the least devoted clergyman. He joined the clergy. Uh, did he ever actually hold any piety or devotion to the Catholic Church? That is very much in question. You know, for a, a bright, ambitious young man like him, it was probably just a way upwards. Noble rights of the church, and so he got himself a bishopric and became an honorary member of the first estate. And then he immediately backed off because it was becoming abundantly clear <laughs> that the third estate was sick of everyone's shit and they were going to start alienating some rights. Talleyrand then drops his bishop hat and puts yep. on his revolutionary beret. There he, he goes. The people crying, Citizens, the time has come to nationalize the church and lay bare the inalienable rights of the people. Yeah, Talleyrand was very useful in the revolution because the revolutionaries could point to him and say, look at him, he's a clergyman, and even he supports nationalizing the church. Of course, like, every, not every, but most other members of the church, the clergy, did not support this, but Talleyrand was a great figure to say, we've got the clergy on our side, when, you know, the revolutionaries really didn't, mostly. The time has come to take back church property, of which I have conveniently recorded a meticulous itemized list during my time as a clergyman. And the revolutionaries yeah. have to Convenient. agree, this guy's got some pretty good words, maybe even the best words. So he gets brought into the new government. He helps draft the Declaration of the Rights of Man. He's working to reform voting rights and securing loans and limiting money printing and advocating new regulation for police and what could possibly go... Oh, right. Him. Reign of terror and all that, Paris devolves into a spiraling typhoon of revolutionary zealotry turned hysteria with no way back out, and Robespierre ordered everyone's heads cut off, including Talleyrand. But luckily for Talleyrand, he was stationed in the safest place a French politician could be at the time, London. He was over there trying to avoid war, like, please, just, just trust me, they'll get their act together. 
That didn't go so well, and then Britain kicks him out, so he's forced to couch surf with Aaron Burr for a little while <laughs> until his friends in France manage to get him How off about the that? list. He gets a fancy new office as foreign minister, and then immediately causes a war with the United States because he wanted the Americans to pay to negotiate with him. But we pretend that never happened because uh, just like every war since... Yes, the famous XYZ affair where American diplomats went to France and... The French treated them rudely and basically asked for a bribe to negotiate. Um, and some say it was just the way of diplomacy in Europe at the time. But the American diplomats were very offended, wrote back to Washington, and it became a, a whole affair in the United States where the public was very upset about the rude treatment their diplomats had received. So that was a bit of a, a diplomatic slip-up on the French side, on Talleyrand's side. 1942, Congress didn't officially declare it to be a thing. All the while, Talleyrand's got his eyes on this up-and-coming General Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. Talleyrand starts writing him fan mail, and although they disagreed on some points, they end up becoming good friends. No, like actually, just good friends. Napoleon ends up letting him in on a little secret that he Talleyrand knew which waves and which movements to ride. He could see where momentum was growing, and he latched on very quickly. Napoleon is obviously a great example. He's planning on overthrowing the government, and Talleyrand decides, you know what? I want a piece of that action. So with some fancy footwork, I'll have to save for the Patreon commentary because it's kind of complicated, Napoleon ends up the most powerful man in France and transforming a consulship into an empire in record time. And then, oh boy, then he really starts popping off. So when Napoleon declared himself emperor, he modeled himself off of Charlemagne and included the title King of Italy. This angered everyone. <laughs> but Napoleon had been planning for this ever since he sold Louisiana to the Yanks and he created a navy to rival Britannia. At least when you also added Spain's navy. Hey, and good unlike purchase for the us. last time Spain tried to invade England, this wasn't going to be decided by some freak weather. This would be a battle of epic proportions, a pivotal moment in world history that stood in the way of French dominion over all Europe. If you can't tell, this is where I'm bringing in Magellan TV. They've got a documentary in Nelson's footsteps that tracks the life of the legendary Great Admiral tie -in. Nelson, Great who tie -in. led the British, and Trafalgar, the world's greatest naval battle that engulfs you in the fiery clash where he gave his life. Good stuff. All I can say in summary is that Britain won hard, and that allowed them to be True. a thorn in Napoleon's side for the rest of his life, even when he won almost every battle he fought on the continent. Basically, Britain placed an embargo on France, and Napoleon said, How can you embargo me when I control all of Europe? And he turned half of Europe into French puppet states and bullied the other half into not trading with Britain anymore. Yeah, this is what we call the continental system, where Napoleon basically created a trade zone that encompassed all of Europe, with the sole goal of keeping Britain out of European trade. Unfortunately, it wasn't very successful, because all the European countries wanted those British goods. So smuggling was very prominent at the time. Not to mention a lot of these European countries were not very happy at Napoleon, given he just conquered them all. So, you know, Britain used its advantage of uh, the English Channel once again to uh, find its victory in this conflict, or at least hold out for years, which they're pretty good at doing. <laughs> I think it might be taken a little for granted in hindsight, but um, that's f***ing insane. No one had that kind of power since Charles V or Charlemagne. For Talleyrand, this meant life was good. Napoleon made him a Prince of Benevento, he's got several chateaus, and a celebrity chef <laughs> at his beck and call. And he tells Napoleon, hey, now would be a great time to consolidate our gains. To peace in Europe, yeah? To peace in... what is that? But... That right there. Ah, uh, there we Portugal. go. They're like one percent of Europe. They're traitors. Uh oh. Napoleon, it's not worth it. Please. This is don't. where it starts to go wrong. And so. This is very accurate. See, Talleyrand was. He wanted to consolidate French gains and leave the French Empire in a powerful position where it would last for. I mean, decades, if not hundreds of years. You know, a, a long-standing French empire. But Napoleon just couldn't stand the damn Portuguese trading with the British. And so, this happened. A war breaks out in Portugal. And it keeps going, and going, and going. And the British yep. have an army on the continent again. And there's Spanish rebels. And on the yep. other side of Europe, Russia's trading. Yep, the Spanish ulcer, it was called. 
Napoleon invades Spain, he fights Portugal, and basically Spanish guerrillas fight Napoleon so hard for so many years that he has to keep a bunch of troops tied up there. It's called the Spanish Ulcer because it wasn't necessarily a full-scale war, but it was this thorn in Napoleon's side for, like, the rest of his wars, basically. It was a big, big mistake. Um... Of course, perhaps not his biggest mistake. <laughs> Getting with Britain again, and Napoleon goes charging in over there. But there we go. This before Napoleon can take Moscow if he wants, but there's there his won't biggest be much mistake. Left by the time he gets there, Talleyrand is starting to see the writing on the wall, and the last thing he wants is for France to get Versailles once this whole thing is over. <laughs> so he starts sending some postcards. Maybe, for instance, he had some secrets that Austria or Russia might be able to get some use of out course. of. And of course. And when the Allies converge on Paris, they find themselves negotiating not with Napoleon, but with a provisional government supported by the Senate. The Tsar of Russia explains, look, we don't hate France, we just really need to get rid of Napoleon. Just hand him over, and we'll go back to before the revolution and pretend you didn't drag the continent into war for 20 years. What do you say, Mr. President? I dig it. Napoleon's carted away to Arkham, otherwise known as Elba, <laughs> and Talleyrand is left to pick up the pieces. The Allies bring back the old monarchy, but with a constitution this time, and they still really want to punish France for declaring war on most of Europe six times, but Talleyrand takes to the stand to defend his country, pointing out, my dear friends, I think it is safe to say you owe me one. Russia, who was there for you when you wanted out of the embargo? Prussia, who gave you a shoulder to cry on when half your land was taken? By you? Look, we might deserve to be punished, but look what happened when one country got too much power. If you cripple France, then Britain would get too much power, and I think I speak for everyone here when I say we do not want that. To peace in Europe. To peace, peace in Europe. Europe. Napoleon has escaped Arkham and taken over France. Waterloo ended up sorting things out, and Napoleon was sent to St. Helena, where he was never heard from again. But the next treaty was a little less lenient, and mm. sure enough, the 19th century belonged to Britain. Albeit not in a take-over-the-entire-continent kind of way. Talleyrand went into a sort of soft retirement, funding a very pro-Orleanist newspaper, and then the House of Orleans actually took over the monarchy, and so it fell to Talleyrand to explain to Britain, No, just because they're monarchs who took over power during a revolution does not mean that there's going to be another Napoleon. Typical Talleyrand, he can't help himself. Uh, into the late years of his career, he still is finding those movements, those people that are going to rise and latching onto them. As you can see, he's a man of uh, little loyalty to people, um, but he is very good at keeping moving up in the world and maintaining a lot of influence throughout his life, so you can give him that. Napoleon. Unfortunately, he died in 1838, just 10 years before France was taken over by another Napoleon. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, the Life and Times of Talleyrand. Obviously, this is a very condensed video, but it was it was a good one. It was entertaining. Uh, it gave us a view into Talleyrand and I think some of the more important parts about him. Basically, as we saw, this man had a skill of moving from movement to movement, from person to person, continuing to gain power and have himself in influential positions throughout you know, the monarchy of Louis the Sixteenth, the Revolution, Napoleon. Talleyrand always managed to go far and influence a lot of foreign policy throughout Europe. So this was a good one. A little more in my wheelhouse than the Historia Civilis videos. Um, anyway, if you guys enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe and like it. If you have suggestions for other videos I should react to, please leave them in the comments. I hope you like this one, and I will see you guys again next time. Goodbye!